This is an irreverent podcast. Check out irreverent.fm for shows from all our friends. Hello and Happy New Year to everyone. This is Ex Angelical, a show about the world inside and outside the evangelical subculture. I'm your host, Blake Chastain. I hope you all had a relaxing and restorative holiday season. I took a week off, but I'm happy to be back in the routine of things, albeit with a little later release this week. Stephen Jones returns today to round out our series on mysticism. We talk about Benedict of Nursia and Lexio Divina, Catherine of Siena and erotic spirituality, and Hildegard of Bingen and the greening of all things. Now, there's a reason I wanted to do the first extended series of Ex Evangelical on Mysticism. For many for- former evangelicals, continuing to engage in religion and spirituality requires some reclamation. A common way to describe spiritual development is a process of construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction. As faith is constructed within evangelicalism and deconstructed through the rejection of it, reconstruction is often difficult, prolonged, or impossible. From my own journey, which I soon hope to share in more detail, mysticism has provided a way to reconstruct and reclaim the aspects of Christianity I have found valuable, and has done so for other friends as well. It makes Christian thought more palatable and allows me to approach it once again. And for those ex-evangelicals who still identify as a religious or Christian, that is a huge comfort. If you have any thoughts or questions about this series, please reach out to me on Twitter at brchastain, and to Stephen Jones at Skeptical underscore Monk. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Pod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Pod, and Instagram at Pod. You can support the show by rating and reviewing the show on iTunes, which helps more people find the show. And you can also support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash Pod. My deepest thanks to Stephen Jones, the Skeptical Mystic, for taking the time to have these conversations with me. There's a lot of self-described mystical cynics and cynical mystics out there in Twitter and elsewhere on the web, and Stephen is your man. Follow him on YouTube via the link in the show notes. All right, let's get into it. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Exvangelical. I have with me again uh, Stephen Jones, the skeptical mystic, here to talk some more about, um, about the mystical tradition. We initially planned for two episodes and then realized we had such a wealth of content that uh, we wanted to go ahead and extend it into three parts. So uh, welcome back to the show, Stephen. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be hijacking your podcast. <laughs> you know, I think it's it, it's appropriate. I, I, I like that this is like Advent Christmas time. It's sort of like the first... Um, I don't know, sort of the first series that we're that that I've done, and I've enjoyed it. So um, today we're starting with we have at least three more people <laughs> we're going to talk about, um, and the first one is uh, Benedict Saint Benedict um, of Nursia. So where should we start with with him and his contribution to uh, to mysticism and Christianity overall? Where should we start? Well, a lot could be said about Benedict because he was such a foundational figure uh, for the Western monastic tradition. Um, He founded several monastic communities, but more importantly, he developed um, a way of life for monastic communities. And that would go on to shape um, what mystical practice looked like in monasteries for centuries. So, I mean, he's a figure of tremendous importance, but really, um, for most of us who are probably never going to live monastic lives, um, the fruit of Benedict's life would really come down to two things. The first meaningful thing, um, for normal, ordinary people to really take from Benedict's life, um, would be a rule of life. Now, he established the rule of St. Benedict, which was um, a very structured and orderly um, manual for living for monastic communities. It prescribed um, hours for prayer and hours for work and 
hours for everything. You know, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you conduct yourselves at certain times of the day? How do you interact with others? Um, and it included uh, the vows that would be taken and everything. Mm-hmm. And throughout the centuries, you get different um, attitudes toward the order. You get more lax interpretations of it. You get more strict interpretations and it develops into this wealth of um, monastic variety. But the point for us is not so much how the, the idea of the rule uh, structured monastic communities, communities, but how they can structure our own lives. Um, the development of a personal rule, a rule of life, a rule of prayer, is a key part of um, a person taking control of their own uh, spiritual lives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes it takes some patience and um, consideration and and some trial and error to develop a rule. Most people, their inclination is to create a rule that's so severe that it won't function for them. Um, I mean, people who are inclined to take on a rule at all are inclined to overdo it. Um, a rule is only going to do you any good if it's something you can keep up, if it's something that fosters life rather than inhibits life. And so we come back to... Um, Pray in the way that works, not in the way that doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, What works for you? Um, What is beneficial for you in this time in your life? Because it will probably change. Where where is the growth at in your life? What's the leading edge of growth? And where is that going? What do we sense might be the next thing that God would be be doing with you? And so it's, it's important also to develop your rule of life uh, with a spiritual director, with someone else who has experience. A spiritual director, um, a lot of people use uh, the image of like a midwife, right? Um, that th- the midwife is not the important person in the room at all. And yet there's a kind of facilitation that happens. An image I like to use is that of a Sherpa, right? <laughs> if you want to climb a mountain, because this mountain imagery is a big deal anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, your best guide is someone who's been up the mountain because the mountain determines how you're going to climb it. Not the, uh, not the Sherpa. Right. Um, but the Sher- but the Sherpa knows how to read the mountain. Yeah. I think that, that, um, I, I, uh, that concept may, may be foreign to, to some people. I mean, I, I never really heard it sort of put in that way as far as like spiritual direction. Um, I've I've definitely heard of like um uh, mental relationships and things like that but um spiritual direction does seem as far as from what I've, from what I've learned uh, it seems to be a phrase or a terminology that's used amongst different orders like catholic orders actually like jesuits and and others there's a Benedict, benedictine sisters in the community near me that offers spiritual direction um but uh but it, it is definitely in that in that vein where where it's about them having an individual relationship with you and coaching you just like you said like a sherpa yeah um, like you said it's it's traditionally been a phrase of a practice um more dominant in catholic uh communities that started to change in the last you know couple decades um, spiritual direction is taking off um, and becoming a more ecumenical phenomenon um, because it is something distinct from mentoring or uh, a lot of these very similar one-on-one relationships because a spiritual director can't have an agenda. Um, a spiritual direction, a spiritual director can't know the answers. Um, they're simply supposed to be very good at being present with you and present with themselves, and present with God, and listening, reading the mountain, so to speak, and helping you begin to read your own mountain. 
which is vital because you know as you and i discussed earlier um we're not necessarily in touch with our true selves all that well and getting an outside perspective especially one that's wise and practiced is a tremendous benefit Mm -hmm. and a good spiritual director will be able to tell you if you're if the rule that you're trying to develop is complete garbage or not, really (laughs) all all a rule is supposed to do is help bring some structure and order to spiritual practice because life tends to be kind of disordered and it's difficult to continue to do the things that we know are good for us, that we know keep us alive, um, that we know keep us at our highest level of consciousness, so to speak. Um, and so an order is just supposed to help facilitate that. And if it's not going to facilitate that, then it's not doing any good. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think uh, Benedict is interesting because he he did um, uh, just he did just kind of go off and <laughs> and basically start this community. And I think from what I from what I understand, and please correct me, but um, it was out of a sort of a, this desire for order. And then he actually had a twin sister, um, that also, uh, did that with, with women and created a community for women as well. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's sort of that pattern that we talked about last time. Yeah. That tend to be these, these significant pairs for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So out of this desire, out of, out of this, um, let's see. As far as him, as far as Benedict creating um, this this order, these rules for monks, monasticism is is a very very specific uh, call. But one of the things that he that he does um, focus on that, that we can do in in lay life is this, his understanding of uh, the the Latin term is lectio divina or divina. <laughs> I think it's divina <laughs> or. Uh, yeah, lex lexio. Yeah, church Latin is a funny thing. <laughs> yeah, lexio divina. Um, we've managed to go. I mean, we're in our third episode talking about um, mysticism here, and we haven't talked about um, reading the Bible at all. I wonder if that's because of our evangelical baggage. Um, <laughs> it could very well be. In fact, <laughs> I feel a little weird talking about it. Like. Hey, there's spiritual benefit from reading the Bible. Ah, uh, I'm a chump for even saying that. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's it's true. You know, centuries of some of the wisest people have attested to that. It's 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 a reality. The question is, how do we use the Bible? It's a set of powerful tools. And the thing about tools is, they're they're neutral power. And they can be used for for good or for evil. And I mean, what do we call tools that are used improperly? Weapons. Weapons. <laughs> and so, I mean, the fact that the Bible has power is nice. But I don't think that handing it out willy-nilly or leaving it here and there uh, amounts to a hill of beans. Because tools take a bit of training especially tools that aren't that intuitive. And let's be honest, good large portions of the Bible are just not that intuitive. Yes, absolutely. Ezekiel, to, to again mention <laughs> our, our, our last episode, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it can be uh, dense and hard to access. <laughs> but part of, part of again, uh, an evangelical background uh, or a Protestant background in general, um, is that you are supposed to be able to uh, approach the text individually and and get something out of it. But with all the with all those sorts of things in mind, what does uh, how does Benedict want us to approach the Bible, or what does what did, how did he approach the Bible that made it useful? You know, this isn't exactly an innovation on his part. However, he did a lot to popularize certain forms of um, using scripture for spiritual development. And so, you know, there's, there's this hymn that I uh, 
that I appreciate. Um, one of the lines is, um, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. Um, and that always struck, struck me. Um, so often we're, we're given this impression that it's in the page where we encounter God. I mean, the, the Bible is, is ink on a page, man. And it's a tradition of putting ink on a page in a particular way. It's, it's not exactly magical on its own. The idea of, of Scripture is that um, this is a collection of texts that we feel are powerful, um, that are useful for... Uh, what, is, what does Paul say in Timothy? Um, uh, instruction. Not, yeah, it's, it's, it's for personal benefit. Right, mm-hmm. it's for it's for raising people up, not for forming rigid doctrine. You know, that's not what the that's not what the texts are set up for. So the idea is that th- the text is a place of encounter. That through the text, beyond the text, we can have an encounter with the living God. And th- I mean, this is deeply related to Jewish my- mystical practice, which grew up around the text that there's a kind of presence that happens when in in study of the text and so letters and language are extremely important in um, jewish mysticism as it develops christian mystical practice didn't go that way so much but it still stressed that in the reading of scripture in particular ways um, the spirit is present to us, that this is a mode of encounter. We've lost much of that because we tend to read even, I mean, there are the inductive study methods, you know, let's, let's um, exegete the text properly. Let's dissect it mm. and um, reduce it to its elements and then find like try to construct meaning back out of it. Well, dissection tends to kill the the living creature that you're dissecting, and inductive Bible study tends to do that. Now, it's important, right? Um, we've gained a lot from that practice, but we've also kind of killed the Bible. Um, we kill its authority, we kill its power. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in my own personal experience, it was right around the time I took inductive Bible study that it became really hard to read the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, so and the question is, how do you find your way back? Right. I'm I'm still trying to answer that question. I mean, if I'm being just being very honest, it's it's still very hard for me to approach the Bible just in general. Um, it was taking inductive Bible study. It was taking Greek. Um, more probably more so Greek than inductive Bible study. Um, but that was just because I was, even though I wasn't necessarily taught inerrancy, it was still kind of difficult to <laughs> to, to approach it in such a te- textual way. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but yes, inductive Bible study and those practices it has absolutely done a lot and to enrich our understanding of things. Um, but I don't know. It's like. Um, trying to exegete things and understand the original audience and doing all those things. Like it does provide helpful context. Um, but then at the same time you're taught to like, don't practice eisegesis. Don't read into the, into the text, your own uh, situation. Be very careful about that. It's, um, but I don't know. At the same time, you you kind of do want to feel like there is something that the Bible can be telling you personally, or something you can draw from it. Um, so absolutely, it's really hard to, um, yeah, it's really hard for someone that's that's taught that to to return to any sort of devotional sort of reading of the Bible. Um, and I don't even know whether devotional is the right term. Because for a lot of people, um, people in in this audience that might have some negative connotations or that might feel you know flaky yeah. or or fake, um, but that's, I think that's why recovering the language of lexio divina is helpful because it's just 
I mean, it translates to divine reading, which doesn't mean much. I mean, we could call it prayerful reading. Mm-hmm. And I think prayerful reading helps um, because it avoids the trap of devotional reading, which has weird, like, Puritan romantic connotations, doesn't it? Uh, at least, yeah. it, at least yeah. it does in my mind. Um, right. And uh, it also avoids the kind of um, dissection, like analytic um, approaches to scripture that prayerful reading can take, can take these other elements into account. You know, if we know other facts about the text, that's fine. All of that is useful. But the goal is to pray with the text. And so how do we do that? Um, Mysticism in the Western tradition is profoundly textual. All of the mystics engage the text in in really significant ways. And so it can be done. The question is, how do we find our way back? And you pointed out really what I think is the key, that we've emphasized exegesis and demonized eisegesis. And there's value in that, right? Because doing that helps you recognize the biases that you bring to the text. We have to recognize that we come from a place, that we have a history, we have a set of concepts, we have a language, we have attitudes and values, and we bring all of these things to the text when we read it. And it's hard to just engage the text and let it challenge all of those things we bring to the text rather than letting what we bring to the text impose itself on the text and determine how we read it. So yeah, getting the cart before the horse in that way is really important. However, let's not pretend that we can ever get to a point where we don't bring things to scripture. Right. And we should, we absolutely should. In fact, um, like exegesis, you know, inductive, the, the inductive methods are not really the hot practice anymore. Approaching scripture from other angles is really important. And so uh, feminists' readings of the Bible are really important. Disability studies readings of the text are really important. Um, recognizing that we come to the text from a place and with identities is vital and that does help us break out of the 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 coffin of exegesis right but still lexio divina takes it a step further and it says that bringing your imagination to bear on scripture is valuable that bringing your presence and your stillness to bear on scripture is valuable that in its most simple form Lexio Divina is the process of being still, present to yourself and present to the world and present to God and present to the text and going deep and then coming back with the text and effectively using the text as a way to listen to God. Because, let's be honest, listening to God is a tricky thing. And so... If scripture has been recommended to us by centuries of, you know, deeply spiritual people as a way to hear from God, then we ought to be able to take that seriously somehow. So, yeah, and it's in its simplest form, it's just about being still and present with the text, being prayerful while we're reading. But then it develops into a whole set of other practices. Like, take, for example, a scene from the Gospels. A short little scene, you know, Jesus walks down the road and has this conversation with the disciples. They encounter this other person, something happens, end of story. I mean, that could be any story from the Gospels, right? Now, while you're in prayer, place yourself there with them. Mm -hmm. And the deeper you go with that, the more effective it can be. Um, Imagine. Fill in the blanks of scripture, right? What is the air like? What is the path like? Um, how dry is it? How does the sun feel on everyone's skin? 
right? How long has it been since Jesus last took a bath? Um, what's the look on this person's face when they encounter? What's the subtext in in the, the conversation? And while you're there, how do you re- how do you respond to it? Um, after that encounter, what do you ask Jesus? And what does Jesus say? And you can see how imagination is a way to engage Scripture in such a way that oper- it opens up new opportunities to listen to God. And I'll be honest, I struggled with that because um, I'm, I'm pretty good at dissecting the Bible. I can pick it apart and I can, I can rob it of its meaning as well as anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and so the idea of being free with my imagination, approaching scripture, um, and trusting that I could hear God and not just invent my own responses, um, that was challenging. But you know when it's not your own imagination. If the answer you get um, changes your life, if what you hear is absolutely not something you would have constructed, you can be relatively certain it didn't come from your own imagination. <laughs> it's 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 a, just a way to open yourself up to listen. Hmm. It's a very powerful proposition. I, 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 I have to say that I, I've never approached an individual sort of meditation or sort of uh, reading of scripture like that personally, um, and I don't want to equate uh, like a teacher or pastor giving a proposition like that (laughs) or like or painting a picture or painting a picture for a group you know and imagining with them um but that's that's i i encourage people to 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 try something like that (laughs) i i know that i'm going to uh give that uh give that a whirl (laughs) um just because Oh, good. You no, know, just because uh, that's definitely huh, that's that's definitely not something I've I've approached that way before. Uh, the because I I've been in a place for a while where honestly the Bible feels more like a stumbling block than anything yeah. else. Um, and yeah, and so um, I don't know. Some people might think I'm. Uh, some people might think that are coming from the Bible being critical to their faith as like, I'm, I'm coming at like I'm approaching from the, from the flank or something. Um, but for a long time, I kind of had to do that in order to continue to develop any idea of, um, of faith or whatever else you want to call it. (laughs) Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would also encourage people to try practices like this and and there are, are resources that can be helpful um that's partly what a spiritual director is for to help you try those practices out because i mean even though i'm encouraging people to try them it's pretty frustrating at first it can be hard to do and so having a guide who's experienced who can try to recenter you or reassure you or or just offer practical suggestions try this or change your passage why are you doing that when you need to be here um those people are um i mean i mean that's that's traditionally how spiritual practices were passed on right through apprenticeship right um you transmit these things person to person because they're the art of being human you I, like texts are not ideal like studying spiritual practices out of texts they're useful and, and and they can be helpful but finding someone who knows is the way to do it mm-hmm. but ultimately all this comes down to is um are you reading the bible to lock down the meaning 
to find the meaning in it, which means now you're in control, right? And now you have authority over what the Bible means, and now you can use that to do things with it. Well, that's that's a weapon, right? Or are you reading in such a way as to open meaning up? Open up the possibility of meaning. Mm, that there mm-hmm. can be multiple meanings. And that in any given moment to any person, God could be saying something very different to them through identical passages. Mm. Because if if we really do believe that the significance of the Bible is that the Holy Spirit works through it to communicate with us, well, then we should be looking for that. Then we should be listening to the Holy Spirit rather than dissecting ink on a page. Yeah. And anyone who wants to explore that more, um, maybe a spiritual director isn't your thing, or maybe in addition to that, um, I I recommend the Life with God Bible. Um, Richard Foster um, and Dallas Willard. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A few of these people have gotten together, and it's it's sort of like a study Bible, but the study notes are not inductive Bible study nonsense. Um, (laughs) They're about spiritual practices, and they engage engage the text from that perspective. It's pretty helpful. Cool. Well, I do want to move on to um, Catherine of Siena. Yeah. Um, we do um, uh, we do have a, a couple more <laughs> segments that we want to make sure um, that we we can cover in this episode for folks. Yeah, um, moving right along. Yeah. So for um, for the the next person on the docket, we've got Catherine of Siena, and um, I do have to plead ignorance with her. I I do know. Um, just, just from, uh, I don't know, want to say her reputation or anything. I just know, I don't know the sort of cliff notes sort of stuff I know about her. Um, she, she's known for what's, uh, what's called erotic spirituality. Um, so, uh, let's unpack that. What's, what's that mean in this context? Uh, Well, she certainly engages in erotic spirituality, um, and that's one of the reasons why it's interesting to talk about her. Um, erotic language um, in mysticism, that's a profound and ancient tradition, it has its roots in Song of Songs, really. Um, I mean, that's not the only place uh, where its roots lie. But we have this poetic expression um, of erotic love between a man and a woman. And... It's in the Bible, and it doesn't overtly talk about God. But the idea is that it expresses dynamics of mystical encounter. Um, That there is a way that our interaction with God is not just familial, like father and children, um, not just creator and, you know, creation. There is this one-on-one kind of romantic passion to it. And there's something really beautiful about that. Um, It enables us to do a lot of brilliant theology. For example, the prophets really latch on to feminine imagery for God. And um, one prophet in particular um, says, you know, there, there is no hope for us in God. That if God is, if God is a God of justice, and we're people who keep offending God's justice, um, there's ultimately no way we're ever going to make God happy. So there's, there is no hope. God can't keep on forgiving. 
and still be just. And so there's no hope. Unless. Unless God is like a crazy lover. (laughs) Unless God is so crazy in love with us that God is willing to put up with our spousal abuse to stay with us. That's powerful. It's also really dangerous. Because a jilted lover is the source of tremendous violence. Mm-hmm. You know, a wounded, erotic love. Because, uh, especially evangelicals, but a lot of Christians go on and on about um, agape, right? Agape is, is the great love. It's selfless, and it's universal, and yada, yada, yada. Fine, yeah. fine. You know, it's valid. But the root of spirituality, the root of, of worship is in eros. It's erotic love. It's desire. Because all of the other loves are for the good of the other. Eros, yeah, the good of the other, but it's also a conviction that the other is the good for me. It's desire. Um, Eros is a love that includes need and demands reciprocation, right? And so that's powerful for worship. That's powerful for theology. But also, it's the source for a lot of violent imagery for God. Right. And and especially, especially, um, is is just is used as justification for violence toward toward women um so there's a whole problematic history with erotic spirituality but it allows us to talk about intimacy with the divine in some powerful ways that there is something not just universal and beneficent about god's love there's something primal and aggressive about god's love we talked in the last episode about the violence of love mm-hmm. and there, there's a kind of violence in parental love, but there's a kind of violence in erotic love. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's dangerous territory for theology and dangerous territory for, for mystical practice. But so many people see that the, the risk outweigh or the, the rewards outweigh the risk. Um, I have to say that the, the, romantic tradition the erotic tradition has had a uh, significant effect on my own practice um how i understand my connection with god hmm. i don't know whether this is sort of correct but when when i was thinking about as you were speaking i was thinking about um examples within within biblical texts in the old testament that sort of uh exemplify what could be the risks and rewards um, like Song of Songs, as you mentioned, would be sort of this, um, this celebration of uh, of physical of physical mm-hmm. desire, um, because again, like you mentioned, there's no overt mention of of God in in there. Um, the woman is um not represented to be married in any way. Um, it's just this celebration of desire uh, itself. Yeah. Um, which. It, which is is beautiful spirituality because it doesn't separate out the spiritual dynamics from the physical di- dynamics, mm-hmm. right? Right. It's actually brilliant, and people have a hard time accepting it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then when I was thinking about the risks um, and kind of the flip side of that, I was thinking of uh, Hosea, mm-hmm. um, which God tells a prophet to marry a prostitute. Uh, Again, as we as we mentioned that Ezekiel was this performance artist. Hosea um, had a really a much shittier sort of performance assigned to him, um, <laughs> and uh, he was told to to marry a prostitute as an example, and then had to name his children terrible names um, mm-hmm. <laughs> that meant all sorts of depressing things. Um, and then, I mean, within that, as you, the within that text, there's uh, if you apply to feminist reading, there's a lot of misogyny in there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, an, another 
podcast that uh, approaches the Bible um, very differently called Sunday School Dropouts. They did an episode on on, on Hosea because they're reading through the Bible, um, but they uh, they talk you know a lot about this sort of misogyny that's present in those sorts of readings. Um, but what um, what are some of the benefits you mentioned? If we can tease those out a little bit, especially from Catherine's perspective, since she is approaching this um, as a as a woman, um, like what what is what is her uh, connection to this uh, to this erotic tradition? Um, what does what does her writing have um, to to say from that feminine perspective? And I know we're two white dudes <laughs> talking. Um, mm. And and I I own that, <laughs> yeah. But, um, well, but I mean, we're just I, doing a survey here. <laughs> and, yeah, um, when I enter into this discussion, I don't enter in, into it as uh, as an expert by any means. I, I'm a student of this, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't take me as any kind of authority. Um, in fact, see this as an opportunity to engage me in conversation. If you, you know, if if one of your listeners. Um, has insights i i'd love to learn right so i'll share what what knowledge you know i know about it but, but sure yeah i'm yeah. I'm, I'm a white guy <laughs> um, but but that's the thing um traditionally um the erotic spirituality has tended to be expressed by female mystics more and there are some reasons why that's easy uh catherine for example um spoke about marriage to jesus Um, in her letters, she would say that she wore a wedding ring that Jesus gave her. And I mean, it it was invisible, right? Like there was, no one saw a ring on, on her finger or anything, but you know, in some sense there was a spiritual wedding ring. And so classically it was easier for women to express erotic desire for Jesus. Um, and now oftentimes they would talk about how it's like a, it's a pure erotic desire because it's not actually about sexual encounter, et cetera. But, I mean, let's be honest. Ero- erotic, the erotic and sexuality are hard to distinguish and maybe usually shouldn't be. Um, because sexual desire is important. Um, in fact, as, as this tradition continues, um, the imagery of of genitalia actually becomes kind of important in some weird ways. Um, for instance, uh, speaking of the the spear wound in the side of Jesus, the crucified Jesus, um, as as a womb. Um, that we all are eternally being born out of and yet never leaving that we all dwell in the womb of Jesus aside. Um, yeah. I, I mean, by today's standards, that's pretty bizarre. That's pretty outlandish. <laughs> um, but I feel like I have a lot to learn from that. Right. Sure. Um, frequently, even though, even though, um, because it's, it's heteronormatively, simple that female mystics would express erotic desire for Jesus more easily than men. At the same time, they would speak of Jesus in the feminine or speak of, of God in the feminine. Um, Hildegard frequently would emphasize the feminine divine. Um, that's one of the things that she's famous for. And so erotic spirituality becomes very complicated because it's not just about eros anymore. Now it's expressed through a multiplicity of gender expressions and not necessarily in heteronormative ways either. It gets weird. And that's partly why it's so awesome. Right. Um, It's like an extension of that sort of non-binary, non-dual sort of things we talked about last, last episode. Yeah. And, and coming coming from a religious tradition that has generally been, you know, pretty exclusive in heteronormativity, um, the fact that there's a tradition that clouds all of that, kind of on purpose, is exciting. 
Mm-hmm. That's something I, that's something I personally want to know more about. Yeah, and I mean as a <clears throat> as a as a straight white guy, I mean there's a lot to just kind of sit back and learn about or read about or whatever you might however you might <clears throat> learn about that. As <laughs> uh there's there's a lot to to uncover and realize that that tradition has validity and has history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so places to go um to explore erotic spirituality more um and and the divine feminine um and including feminine language for Jesus. Uh Catherine is a good place to go. Um Teresa who we've already discussed is a good place to go. Um Julian of Norwich. Um Angela of uh, Foligno. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing Foligno correctly, but and then Hildegard. Hildegard is uh, maybe my favorite mystic. They can be hard to read. Maybe pick up a secondary source on them first, <laughs> um, unless you know, unless you're a bold reader, go for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's um let's actually use Hildegard as a bridge to our uh our final section um which is about um what we what you mentioned as a, as a more cosmological or or sort of Christ project uh sort of uh framing for these last few that we're going to talk through. Um so Hildegard is uh I I just recently purchased a a book of her sort of selected uh writings and just reading um sort of the introductory introductory text uh, at the beginning <laughs> even even scholars uh that were studying her 20 years ago were sort of hesitant to sort of pin her down <laughs> um yeah. into a particular uh area of study or really try to narrow her down but um uh, just because her interests were so varied um during her life uh but one of the things that she's known for is this idea of greening um so what does what does that entail <laughs> yeah greening greening is beautiful um sometimes i just don't even know where to start with hildegard um i feel like i feel like if we were contemporaries i'd probably annoy her um cuz i'd be i'd be after her <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious about about how she thinks. Um, anyway, yeah, she she had her fingers in all the pies. She was interested in in herbs and and rocks and gems, and she classified all kinds of um, natural observations. She did all kinds of um, for for its time serious scientific work, and also she had visions from the time she was a young girl, and. Uh, in a medieval period when women had very little authority and she struggled to even find authority over her own life. Um, yet she ends up going on preaching tours around Europe and the Pope listens to her and the emperor listens to her. Hmm. Absolutely a phenom. Her story is unbelievable. Um, but part of the reason why she gains this authority um, is be- is because of her 
strange and intuitive and passionate connection with God. In Latin, uh, the word she uses is veriditas. Um, it's like greening or greenness, or if if you could say greening as a noun, maybe that would be it. But <laughs> greening is is also a verb. It's a it's a living, growing, dynamic reality. She would look out at the world around her, and say, "Look, everything is coming alive." If you don't see that, keep looking. Everything is coming alive. Everything is being made new. And so greening becomes the language for it because of spring. I mean, that's for those of us in temperate climates, uh, like in in the Northern Hemisphere, like spring is the time when green shows up. Mm -hmm. The shift from winter into summer is, you know, that's, that's resurrection imagery. And she says, all things are being resurrected in that way. Everything is being made new. That God is alive and active and dynamic and passionate. Um, And this was a a needed corrective to a very lofty, holy, and holy out of touch, you know, image of God. That despite whatever philosophical issues might be at stake. Um, There are images of God that are valid and powerful that have everything to do with God walking around on the earth. That when God's present in the earth, God walks barefoot through the soil. And God breezes through the leaves on the trees and God picks up stones and seashells and marvels at their beauty, that God is more like the most alive parts of us than God is like the most dead parts of us. Hmm. And, and so it's, it's life itself, liveliness, if you, if, if you will, that speaks most to who God is. When, when we are being made alive, that's how you recognize God. That's how you distinguish between God's voice and other voices, is that when you listen to this voice, you are made new, you are made alive. That this has practical and vital implications. And so greening is a natural phenomenon, and greening is the spiritual reality that we participate in um greening is physics and biology but greening is also teleology uh greening is how god's work in the world is bringing everything to fruition and fruition being the the absolutely appropriate and potent word there Mm -hmm. that whatever whatever fruit all of creation is supposed to bear. It will happen because God is a busy gardener. God loves God's plants. Mm -hmm. I really respond to that sort of imagery um, because of that natural language, uh, because it imbues, and this is something we've, we've talked about before, it imbues the very physical with um, reverential and spiritual meaning. Um, and that's very powerful in, in this moment in history because, of, because we need that sort of thinking in order to motivate us at different times to preserve this, <laughs> to preserve the, the things around us. Um, and uh, it's, it's present in... In more modern the- theology, N.T. Wright wrote a great essay called "Jesus Is Coming: Plant a Tree." Yes, and it was yes, and it was very much about very much about um, even even the vision in Revelation. It wasn't that this world is scrapped. It's not that this world's going to burn. It's that no that that God descends and God um, it's joins us. Right. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. and. Uh, and that's precisely the point. 
<laughs> yes, um, it is precisely the point. <laughs> that, the point being that God's project won't fail. Right. That, that God won't fail at God's project. God gets what God wants. And try as we might, we can't stop it. Right. We can either cooperate and enjoy it, or we can be frustrated at our failure to stop it. Right? That's, yeah. that's our only choice. Do yeah. we cooperate, or do we live lives of frustration? Right. <laughs> which, which, is why, which is why a lot of people like the language of, of Christ Project for, for this whole mishmash of um, all of creation and whatever God is busy doing now in creation, whatever God is busy doing in me and in my community, mm-hmm. it's all, it's all the Christ project. And a lot of that language, um, it stems ultimately from Paul, but it's, inig- it's, 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 it's initially made a big deal in theological and mystical circles by, um, Maximus the confessor. Um, he really develops this idea of the cosmic Christ. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's all through the new Testament. Right. Yeah, well, you've got with, Col- Colossians where um, he talks about it. <laughs> yeah, Colossians and and uh, also I think in Romans and in uh, Paul calling it Jesus the first fruits of the new creation. Yeah, yeah. And, and in Him we live and move and have our being. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, in what do we live and move or have our being? The right. cosmos, creation. When when John sets out to write his gospel, how does he? How does he? talk about the infancy narrative what's his birth story for jesus <laughs> it's in <on> the beginning <laughs> was was the logos and right. the logos was god and the logos was with god what the crap is he talking about <laughs> yeah he's talking about the the shalom the peace the order the ordering principle of all creation um the the defining structure that holds everything together became a person that fries my brain. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's the prologue to John's gospel. And we read it in these like reverential tones in our Christmas Eve services or wherever. Uh, If you're liturgical enough to bother with John's gospel in Christmas services, um, we read it with such reverential tones. Um, this is subversive, crazy nonsense. <laughs> uh, there's, there's nothing reverent about this. This is, if there's any truth to the prologue to John's gospel, holy cow, we're saying weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's in keeping with the rest of, of the biblical story about somehow the, the order, the peace was taken out of the world. And that however we explain it, Jesus is how it comes back. That order is being restored. Peace is being restored. And we're invited to participate in that. We have a role to play in the Christ Project. That's what's beautiful and crazy about Christ Project language is that I am the Christ Project. And you are the Christ Project. And all of creation is the Christ Project. And I get to play a role in the Christ Project also. Like I get to do something to contribute. That's, that's a profound invitation. And so that's, those are the stakes when we're talking about mystical practices. That's why there's so much emphasis on who am I really? And who is God really? And what does God want from me really? Mm-hmm. What's God busy doing? Because only when you've encountered the living God can you, in any sense, approach what's going on in the Christ Project, where that's going, and what you get to do as a part of it. Right. Yeah, it's extremely empowering. <laughs> it gives yeah. you, even though we've talked about the idea that you, uh, as part of the mystical um, understanding of things, oftentimes you relinquish your idea of control. Um, mm-hmm this sort of approach can actually imbue you with a sense of agency. Um, yes. Not to, uh, 
not that you have control over everything or that you have control over the speed in which you develop, but in the way that your contribution, um, mm-hmm. the way you might live your life, the way you, uh, however, yeah. however that might be, you, um, you, you becoming something matters. <laughs> right. Right. Um, Who you become matters. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think that's another interesting way in which I feel like myst- uh, a more mystical understanding or a more um, uh, non-dual or um, non-rational sort of uh, understanding of the world can, can uh, convey a deeper sense of meaning for people in in this moment in history <laughs> because it it's it it in it very literally sort of redeems your sense of worth in a massive infinite universe <laughs> yes yes <laughs> it uh, it turns it it turns your life and your life story into something of consequence <laughs> if if there's ever been a time for mysticism to play a more dominant role in 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 Western religious tradition, this might be it. Yeah. Because it's a form of, of the Christian faith that isn't afraid to deal with heavy duty issues. Like I'm basically insignificant and um, (laughs) I can't ever know God. And like all of these horrible truths about our existence and that can be totally okay. You know, it reframes everything for us and gives us an opportunity to have personal value and to, to embrace all of creation, um, to, um, set boundaries for myself and protect myself. And yet also to be profoundly generous, to engage the world. It, it, it does everything. Mm -hmm. Everything belongs. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a great, um, that, that's a great phrase that I think just speaks to the, to the way in which it's, um, I'm, I'm very, very, uh, at the, really at the very beginning of, of investigating these types of writings of investigating this type of, uh, thinking and, and practice. Um, but I'm, very very thankful uh to have to have you on the show and to talk through just this um the breadth of different types of traditions out there um and and speak to the ways in which we we as people in 2016 2017 whenever you might be listening to this um as as ways to basically explore being human (laughs) and and what what that means whenever you have a concept of um a concept of the divine i don't even know how to phrase it like uh you know um whatever that might be it's uh i i still am kind of crappy at (laughs) like conveying what um what that thing is uh, you know the other or Mm -hmm. or the divine or 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 however you uh, approach it um yeah and um and it this the, these traditions have things to tell us and we might uh, we'd have to be thankful for that we have to <laughs> um and acknowledge that and i'm very thankful mm-hmm. that that you've taken the time for the past few weeks to to do this and dive into all these different things that you've explored through um through your own journey and i'm very very thankful for that um <laughs> it's it's been a privilege man and i'm i'm so thankful that you uh invited me to have these conversations with you um so i uh and again yes thank you um so I do want to encourage everyone to um, follow Stephen on Twitter at skeptical underscore monk. Please follow him on uh, YouTube at the skeptical mystic. Um, search for that channel. Um, he's got a lot of great things to say um, in in all manner of ways. He approaches these subjects, and um, he is a very <laughs> kind and gracious person. Um, uh, so 
if you want to engage in these things, um, please uh, reach out to him online. Um, I, I don't think he'll mind me saying. I don't think you'll mind me saying that, right? No, uh, no, no. So, I welcome interaction. Yeah. So, um, be, because he is just a, a wealth of knowledge and uh, and wisdom, and um, please uh, do that um, so that so that you can continue to. Um, to explore these things, if if any of them have found resonance with you, um, one uh, one thing that I that uh, Stephen mentioned that I want to kind of cap this off with is that uh, I think you mentioned you mentioned this in the first episode, Stephen, which is that um, there are as many um, types of mysticism as there are personalities. So mm-hmm. um, so it's a it's a wide uh, wide series of coexisting traditions and um, i'm very thankful again for you walking through them with me (laughs) yeah absolutely 